In many SDBR implementations, the rate of improvement is slowed by a capacity constrained resource. This isn't true for every plant or implementation, but when a CCR emerges, I'll call it a CCR from now on, we need to take action if we are to significantly reduce the manufacturing lead times and improve due date performance. So what exactly is a CCR? Simply put, a CCR is a resource that struggles to keep up with demand given its current mode of operation. A CCR manifests itself in various ways, but the most obvious is that there is usually a relatively large queue of work orders in front of the CCR, relative, that is, to the other queues in the plant. It is very rare that the CCR processes all of the queue of work in front of it. Often the queue appears static or varying slightly in size as flow through the plant fluctuates. However, experience suggests that frequently CCRs are not hard constraints on the performance of the plant. Many are CCRs because we don't pay sufficient attention to how the CCR's capacity is used. And this is usually because we don't understand how critical it is to determining the overall performance of the plant. So the good news is, if we help our people to understand the importance of the CCR, the situation can be transformed very quickly indeed, and this directly and quickly improves the performance of the plant as a whole. So what does managing the capacity of the CCR really mean? In order to answer that question, we need to understand one of the core frameworks in the theory of constraints. Understand this and we will have our answer. The theory of constraints five focusing steps was articulated by Goldra and understanding it is fundamental to a good understanding of TOC itself. It gives us a simple and robust framework which we can use to improve the performance of any system. In an SDBI implementation, it will help us to identify numerous actions that improve flow at the CCR many of which will require little or no investment but deliver a huge return. Goldratt taught us that all systems exist to achieve a goal. For a manufacturing company, that is most likely to be make money now and in the future. For a school, it would be to educate pupils, a hospital to treat patients, etc. etc. I'll talk a lot more about this in a future video, but for the purposes of this series of videos, let's assume that the goal of our little plant is to make money now and in the future. So, how do we use the five focusing steps to help us improve our ability to achieve more of our goal? The constraint of a system determines its ability to achieve its goal. It limits us from achieving more of what we want. So, step one of the five focusing steps, identify the system's constraint, requires us to focus our attention on the one area of our whole operation that is currently determining the performance of the system. Think of it this way. Any manufacturing operation has thousands of things about it that can be improved. For example, we could invest in decorating the reception area, giving it a nice coat of fresh paint, a new comfortable sofa, soft lighting, a display of our products, etc. And customers who visit our plant would really like it. It would provide a great introduction to our business. But will it help us achieve more of our goal? Will it increase flow through the plant and reduce the time it takes us to produce customer orders? It is highly unlikely that it will, and if, for example, speed of delivery is an important need for our customers, we will have spent time and money improving something that makes little or no difference to our customers. Now, for our little plant, we've already stated that market demand is the constraint. That is one of the four simplifying assumptions of SDBR. The plant could do more work if only we could sell more, and here's where we need to be a little more sophisticated in our understanding of the five focusing steps. The market is and will probably remain the constraint of our little plant, but our ability to elevate the constraint, or in other words achieve more of our goal, is itself determined by the speed at which we can take a customer order, process it through the plant and convert that order into an invoice that the customer pays. The thing that currently prevents us from doing this is, of course, the CCR. The rate of throughput at the CCR is slower than the rate of throughput at all other work centres. This causes a large queue of inventory to build and, as we now know, inventory equals lead time. Therefore, if we want to reduce the manufacturing lead time, we have to get rid of the queue. And in order to get rid of the queue, we need to improve flow at the CCR. This will improve our ability to address the constraint of our system, which is market demand. Many customers appreciate speed of delivery and being fast solves a problem for them. Being fast has a value for our customers. A long manufacturing lead time prevents us from giving our customers something that they value. So, in short, if we could make stuff faster, customers would place more orders with us. 
This is not always true. In some markets, speed of delivery isn't as valuable or speed beyond a certain point is not valuable. But it is true in many, many industries, so let's go with it for the purposes of this lesson. The fastest way to increase flow at the CCR is to make sure it works every second possible. You're probably thinking, surely they do that anyway, particularly if they've been focused on maximising efficiencies. Well, yes, you would think so. However, in practice, it is very difficult to maximise utilisation on one resource in the production flow, and it is impossible to do it across all resources. So, maximising utilisation is often the intent, but the reality can be quite different. So, how do we follow step two of the five focusing steps to exploit or squeeze the most from the system's constraint? CCRs lose capacity for many reasons. For example, sometimes they run out of work orders to work on. Sometimes they only have the wrong work orders to work on. Sometimes, if the CCR is a machine, it can stop at shift changes or breaks. There are many reasons. So, if we want to exploit the capacity of the CCR, we must make sure we do everything possible to ensure the CCR is always able to work. This will immediately increase the rate of throughput at the CCR and reduce the manufacturing lead time for the plant as a whole. This is, of course, the subject of this video, but before we get into the practical details, let's pursue our exploration of the five focusing steps for a little longer, as it will stand us in good stead for the discussions to come. In order for us to successfully exploit the system's constraints, it almost always requires the cooperation and active engagement of many different groups of people in the plant. This is step three, subordinating to the above decisions. Which decisions, you ask? The decisions we made to exploit the system's constraint. For example, if the CCR is a machine, one way to exploit its scarce capacity is to make sure that the machine is in good working order, all required maintenance is performed and up to date. And, if the machine breaks down, then maintenance drops whatever else it is doing in the plant and comes running to the CCR. The CCR currently determines our overall performance. If it breaks down and maintenance is working elsewhere, possibly performing repeated tests of the plant coffee machine, the whole plant is losing throughput while maintenance works on a non-constraint. This is what subordinate really means. It's very easy to talk about, but quite often challenging in practice as it requires people to prioritise something for which they may not be responsible or something that they may feel makes them inefficient. But subordinating properly to the need to exploit the constraint is vital to us being able to achieve more of our goal. Step four of the five focusing steps is elevate the system's constraint. For our little plant, which is trying to increase flow at the CCR, this simply means getting more capacity. There are two main ways to do this. Firstly, you can increase the capacity available within the period for which the CCR is available. So, let's assume our little plant works just one eight-hour shift per day. A way of elevating the constraint, or getting more capacity at the CCR, is to invest in another machine. This may or may not be an expensive option, but that is why we pursue steps to exploit and subordinate first before we go to step four. In practice, many companies simply buy more capacity, but the improvement possible by first exploiting and then subordinating repeatedly is often huge. I personally would assume at least a 30% increase in output in most cases, and it is frequently much, much more. This saves the company from unnecessarily investing precious capital in equipment that isn't really needed and could be better used elsewhere. The second way of elevating capacity is to extend the time the CCR is available. So, following the example we just gave, if our CCR is only available for one 8-hour shift, it might be cheaper and faster to add another shift. This is a simple way to extend the time for which the CCR's capacity is available. This could significantly increase throughput for a very small increase in operating expense and at the same time prevent us investing what could be a considerable amount of scarce capital. But, as I mentioned earlier, experience demonstrates that it's very often possible to significantly increase the available capacity at the CCR and therefore flow throughout the plant and completely avoid the need to elevate. This cannot be emphasised enough. The challenge for many manufacturing plants is to be more effective in utilising the capital that has already been invested, not to add more. Steps 2 and 3 help us to do this. Step 5 of the 5 focusing steps just means continue to improve. This needs very little explanation. Almost all manufacturing businesses recognise that they are in a competitive environment and if they don't continually improve, the competition will overtake them and they will eventually go out of business. 
Step 5 emphasizes this reality and simply says that after improving, do not stop. Do not stand back and admire your achievements, not for too long anyway, but get on and continue to improve and the fastest way to do this is to go back to step 1. Identify the new constraint and because the constraint determines the performance of the system as a whole, improvement there is the fastest, surest way, in fact often the only way, to improve the system's performance as a whole. So we'll pause our exploration of the TOC's five focusing steps there, but the implications of this framework are huge for leaders and entrepreneurs. But the discussion goes way beyond the scope of this video, so let's now look at how we apply this framework to creating more capacity at the CCR in our little plant. There are many more than 12 ways to exploit and subordinate to a constraint. However, this list provides a good starting basis and will give any manufacturing leadership team guaranteed increases in capacity at the CCR provided the different tactics are implemented sufficiently well. I won't bore you by reading the whole list, instead let's look at each in detail. The theory of constraints is a pull manufacturing method. This means that actual customer demand should trigger or pull from production wherever possible. Not forecasts, not the efficiency syndrome or EOQs or the need to save setups, just actual customer demand. Where finished goods stocks are held, replenishment should be done on the basis of actual consumption, not forecasted. Plants using SDBR successfully typically have very short manufacturing lead times for the reasons we have already discussed and can react quickly to changes in demand. Attempting the impossible, i.e. trying to forecast the future, just isn't necessary or indeed viable production management strategy and I will talk a lot more about this in future videos on the theory of constraints approach to managing supply chains. But suffice to say now that if your lead time is very short, responding to increases in demand is much less problematic than it is with a very long lead time. Therefore, you simply don't need to overproduce to cover yourself against unanticipated increases in demand. But even after implementing SDBR, sometimes old habits die hard. I've worked in several plants that have implemented SDBR successfully, gotten great results, and then when we looked closely, we found that planners or supervisors were increasing the batch sizes to cover for orders that they thought might materialize or create batches that were more like economic order quantities. From an SDBR perspective, this is simply unnecessary overproduction. And when we have a CCR preventing further improvement, overproduction reduces the available capacity on the CCR to process work orders which actually have customer names associated with them. So don't do it, only produce what is necessary to satisfy customer demand. The first way to increase capacity on the CCR is to ensure that this is what we're doing. No inflating batches to make EOQs. No playing guess the future and releasing work to the plant to cover for as yet unconfirmed orders. You need to stop this practice if it occurs and it is prudent to occasionally check, check and check again that only the required raw material is being released and nothing above that. By rigorously, I don't mean just asking the planners or supervisors responsible. I mean actually auditing a small sample of work orders and comparing what was released and made versus the quantity required by the customer. Of course, if you have quality or yield issues that cause you to lose some quantity of product through the process, then of course you have to account for that. Partial shipments to customers are no fun for anyone, not the customer or production who incur the additional setups. So be sensible here and note the problem down. It may be worth returning to it later and resolving the cause of this issue. The second way we get more capacity from a CCR is always ensuring that it has work to do. Given that we're in the early stages of the SDBR implementation and discussing the CCR, this is inevitably the case. But it's worth emphasising as it removes the risk of one of the necessary inputs to exploiting the CCR not being available and the CCR stopping work as a result. Even if the CCR works slightly out of sequence, this is better than the CCR stopping and doing nothing. Bear in mind that time lost can never be regained. And at this stage of the implementation, a minute lost on the CCR is a minute lost for the entire plant. So some throughput is better than no throughput. That said, it is much easier for everyone if the queue at the CCR is correctly sequenced according to the buffer management priorities and it is often very beneficial to delegate this responsibility to one or more people who work at the CCR and who can ensure that it is done consistently. 
the CCR should then follow this correct sequence. And again, it's worth re-emphasizing. While the operator may pick within the color zone of the buffer, they must complete all orders within the color zone before moving on to product work orders in a lower priority zone. So all reds must be completed before any yellows are processed and so on. Saving setups should not really feature unless you group orders within the same color zone that share the same setup. Despite me arguing against saving setups earlier on, this is where our understanding of the importance of the constraint to determine performance of the system as a whole needs to become a little more subtle and nuanced. Saving setups on a CCR can be a good thing as it reduces the capacity lost setup. Generally speaking, saving setups on non-constraints is not a good idea as it tends to pull work orders out of the sequence determined by market demand and once again we're on the slippery slope back to thinking from a local optima perspective instead of a global optima perspective. But on a CCR it can be helpful when the CCR is really overloaded and setups take a significant amount of time. Producing something too soon is also discouraged. Let's say, for example, that the CCR has three red orders one of which has a due date of tomorrow and two of which have due dates for three days time but which share the same setup. Despite what I said above, there is no good logic to suggest that on that basis alone that we should produce the two orders required in three days time over the order due tomorrow just because it saves us a setup. Due date performance will suffer if we miss the order that needs to ship tomorrow. We should produce the order that needs shipping tomorrow and then move on to the other red orders. Frankly, if setups are a real issue for the CCR, we need to reduce the time it takes to set up, not avoid setups, and I discuss this in a minute. Cherry picking nice, easy or favourite jobs is also not allowed, but this is typically greatly reduced after we have choked the raw material release and we are in a lower inventory environment. So, less of a concern, but something to watch out for. 15 minutes at the start of the day while we get ourselves sorted out, 15 minutes of coffee, 30 minutes or even 45 for lunch, maybe another 15 minutes in the afternoon, and before you know it, the CCR has lost an hour's production per day or even per shift. It may not sound like a lot on that basis, but add it up over the course of a week or a month and pretty soon that lost capacity accounts for a significant portion of the CCR's queue. Correct this and ensure operator cover is always available to keep the CCR working and throughput goes up immediately and for no extra cost. This is a very easy way to increase throughput. You may need to train more operators to operate the CCR but this should be factored into your training and development plans for the plant anyway. The any job, any time, any person principle works well here. Determine who is competent to operate the CCR, how competent they are, with complete mastery at the top of the scale and can't even point out the CCR from a group of machines at the other end and give each operator a grade out of 0 to 5. This is usually sufficient. Set about training more people to operate the CCR machine and over time increase the numbers of competent operators and the average skill level overall. This will enable you to maintain flow at the CCR and exploit its scarce capacity. As you've heard me say on numerous occasions now, the constraint determines the performance of the system as a whole. A minute lost here is a minute lost for the entire system. Processing parts on the CCR that have already been made defective by a process or work center upstream of the CCR is a waste of the CCR's precious capacity. If you have a problem like this, as an interim step to addressing the cause of the quality problems causing the defects, I strongly recommend that parts are inspected by whichever department or person is responsible for quality before they are processed by the CCR. This will prevent a loss of capacity and ensure that the CCR only processes viable parts. OK, this is the fifth tactic for exploiting capacity at the CCR. If the CCR is an assembly process, it's usually a good idea to implement a kitting process if you haven't already done so. Assembly processes are notoriously difficult to manage. Synchronizing the flow of all required parts to be present at assembly in the right quantity at the right time to progress a work order is not easy. And, as such, these operations can experience a huge loss in throughput while they wait or search for parts needed to process work orders. Let me explain by way of an example. In one SDBR implementation I led, it became obvious that the work centre we initially nominated as our CCR was no longer struggling to generate the required level of throughput. Improvements at the CCR had increased flow 
throughout the plant and now a large queue was growing in front of an assembly operation which happened to be the final process before the order was packed for shipping. Work orders were moving through the plant at such speed that many were arriving for assembly in the green zone of the buffer, some in the yellow zone but none in the red. However, once those work orders hit the queue at assembly, flow would then dramatically slow and the work orders would languish waiting to be processed and would then penetrate in the red zone of the buffer and some were even going into the black zone. My client and I agreed to spend an hour or two observing the operation to see what we could learn about how the work centre was operating. My hypothesis was that capacity was being seriously diminished because of time lost to gathering all of the required parts in one place before assembly could begin. I also guessed that missing parts were preventing work orders from progressing and this was causing them to move through the buffer zones into the red and even become late. As we sat and watched, we observed the workers at the assembly. There were five to six of them working on work orders separately and in pairs. A few minutes after we arrived, we noted one worker walk away from the assembly area and into the plant. Some 20 minutes later, I mentioned to my client that the worker who had walked off had still not returned. My client surmised that he may have left work for the day but wasn't sure. A further 10 minutes went by and sure enough, the worker returned to the assembly area carrying a large number of parts required for the work order he was intending to work on. 30 minutes of production lost on just one work order while the worker searched for parts. Now it's important to say that my hypothesis was not the result of deep insight or some special manufacturing superpower I possess. They just were entirely predictable effects that I had learned about from Dr. Goldratt's teaching on manufacturing and assembly operations in particular. But this little observational clue gave us a hint that large amounts of capacity were being lost while workers at the assembly operation went to search for parts. We explained the situation to my client's colleagues, what we had observed and we formulated a plan. One worker on the day shift would be dedicated to kitting work orders prior to assembly producing them. Work orders would obviously be kitted in accordance with the buffer priorities so that a worker could select from the top of the queue and process the order. The changes were implemented the very next day and there was an immediate huge improvement. The kitter was chosen because he was the guy who was complaining the most about missing parts. He turned out to be a brilliant choice and he did a great job of kitting work orders for his colleagues to work on. But even then not everything went to plan. We learnt about shortages of low value consumable items, missing purchase parts and about the administration required to issue materials that was way in excess of what was justified. So this gave Assembly the opportunity to further improve its process. By the end of the first week, Assembly was shipping more than 300% more work orders in the day shift, an unbelievable improvement for no extra cost. The process was later refined so that the queue was only built to a certain level. At this point, the kitter could then return to working as a normal assembly operative, assemble products and generate throughput, safe in the knowledge that there was a substantial queue of work to protect the assembly CCR. So, if the CCR is an assembly type process and there is no kitting process in place, I'd recommend using this approach to reduce lost capacity. When the CCR is a resource that requires long setups to change over between different work orders, operators inevitably find themselves in a dilemma and it pays to think this through carefully from their perspective. On the one hand, the operator has been told to maximise production at the CCR. They have taken this message on board and, in order to do this, they try to avoid setups wherever possible to prevent time that could be used to produce being lost to a setup. On the other hand, they know that they should follow the buffer management priorities and this may mean frequent changeovers to manufacture different products causing a loss of production time. What should the operator do? If they avoid setups wherever possible, they will get pulled away from the buffer management priorities, away from the market demand and customers will not be happy when their orders are late. Or do they lose overall throughput because they are changing over to different jobs and setting up frequently? The answer lies in understanding that the time taken to set up a resource is more often than not a function of our preparation for the setup. Or, in other words, if we prepare and organise properly for setups, setup time can be reduced dramatically, and when this happens, the dilemma simply doesn't exist. For example, one of my clients had a machine that typically took six to eight hours to set up. It was the CCR of their plant. When they began to scrutinise the setup process in detail, 
they identified numerous ways in which the time was being lost unnecessarily. For example, they found that the operators did not prepare in advance of a setup and would only go to search for raw materials, tools, drawings, etc. needed for the next job at the point the machine finished the current job, thus increasing the time it took to set up. This and many other improvements to practice eventually got the setup to under 15 minutes. From 8 hours to 15 minutes, that's a huge increase in the amount of usable capacity. So I strongly recommend the following. Don't avoid the setup, instead reduce the time it takes to set up. This is almost always possible and the improvement is often dramatic. And the place where the improvement has the biggest impact on performance of the plant as a whole is obviously on the constraint or in the case of our little plant, the CCR. It's all very well asking everyone to reduce the time it takes to set their machine up, but you will inevitably be spread thinly, possibly need to spend a large amount of capital on various bits of tooling and kit for each and every work centre, and the time it takes to get results will inevitably increase. It's far better to focus on one work centre at a time and to start with the CCR, where you will get the biggest improvement to flow through the plant. Then. When the process to set up at the CCR is well defined and practiced, you can move on to the next work centre with the least protective capacity. The protective capacity concept is beyond the scope of this video, but I do discuss this in On Time in Half the Time Part 2, so watch this video to learn more about it. The important points for our discussion here is firstly, to not avoid setups, but to work to reduce the time they take, and then secondly, to reduce the time it takes to set up through proper organisation and preparation. This work, when performed on the CCR, will often yield a big improvement in available capacity. Cycle time is the time it takes the CCR to produce one part. Like trying to reduce setups across numerous work centres simultaneously, widespread cycle time reduction initiatives tend to be frustrating and take a long time to show results. However, if the initiative is focused on the CCR, improvements can be seen relatively quickly. For example, in one SDBR implementation, a cutting process was nominated as the CCR. The CCR operator attended the SDBR training we conducted before the implementation, and he appreciated the importance of generating as much throughput at the CCR as possible. Having thought about this, he recognised that not all of the programmes used to cut parts were optimal. Having been adapted from a program created for another part, the CCR was required to perform actions that were unnecessary to many of the parts it processed. Removing these actions from the programs where they were not necessary reduced the time it took the CCR to process the part. In other words, the cycle time came down and this increased the available capacity on the CCR. By the way, this anecdote also demonstrates the importance of including operators in the SDBR implementation planning if you were in any doubt, as they will often have a deep understanding of how the plant and its work centres operate and can find creative ways to increase throughput of the CCR. It's often the case that when the CCR is a machine, the plant will have more than one machine that can do the job, but typically the decision to focus production on one machine over the other is made on the basis of speed. For instance, I worked in one plant that printed industrial manuals on a large press. When touring the plant, we inquired about how much work was waiting to be processed by the press. Four weeks worth of work was the answer. As we discussed this, we noticed two smaller, older presses that were sat idle, just to the side of the newer, larger press with a four-week queue. We asked the obvious question, how much of the work in the four-week queue could be processed by the older, smaller, idle presses? A lot of the work came back the answer, not all of it, but a lot all the same. So why, we inquired, were the older presses idle? Why not process some of the queue on the older presses? Surely, with the older presses working too, the four-week queue could be completed sooner. Speed was the answer. The older presses were much slower than the new press, and the cost would become uncompetitive, we were told. This is, of course, absolute nonsense. But this standard cost in logic is pervasive, widespread, and very damaging to us achieving our goal of making more money now and in the future. It can be basically described as follows. The faster the machine, the less direct labour that is attributed to the part or work order. The amount of direct labour required by the part or work order determines how much overhead is allocated to the part or work order. Overhead is usually a multiple of direct labour. Any increase in direct labour, such as being processed on a slower machine, 
will not only increase direct labour but will also significantly increase overhead. Significant increases in cost means that we don't make any profit on the job. As I said above, this is nonsense. The product cost and product profit concept is thoroughly obsolete now and has been for decades. Using it as a basis for decision making in a manufacturing organisation with a modern cost structure and cash flow is deeply misleading and will more often than not cause you to make decisions that take you away from your goal. It is beyond the scope of this video to explain why this is the case and the subject will be dealt with in detail in a dedicated series on throughput accounting. But suffice to say now, the cost per part calculation was invented in the early days of the Industrial Revolution and it was only ever intended as an estimate. The assumptions on which it is based are no longer valid. Raw materials are now a much lower proportion of total costs, labour no longer varies with output and overhead is a far larger proportion of total costs. Moreover, profit is only earned at the organisation level, not at the product or work order level. And this is no secret, the management accounting profession have known about the problems inherent in the product cost product profit calculation for decades. That's why they always ask what you intend using the numbers for when you ask for them. From a theory of constraints perspective, offloading work from a CCR to an even slower machine makes perfect sense, provided the slower machine can do the job to the required quality. The non-CCR resource inevitably has spare capacity as it is not the CCR, and it will increase total throughput. This means the queue in front of the CCR goes down, even though the non-CCR resource is not as fast as the CCR. Speed to do the individual part is, in fact, of little concern. If we are exploiting available capacity on the CCR, which of course we will be doing even a non-CCR resource operating at just 5% of the speed of the CCR will increase the total amount of throughput generated. In practice, the difference between the CCR and the non-CCR is likely to be much smaller and this offers us a great way to significantly increase throughput. This tactic even works if the non-CCR we offload to can only do part of the job needed as it also reduces the amount of time required on the CCR, freeing up capacity to be used for other work orders. Offloading is usually possible for little or no additional cost. Typically in a machine shop operators can operate more than one machine and there is often no need to employ additional operators. Throughput goes up, operating expenses stay the same, you make more money. Poor reliability at the CCR can have a devastating impact on throughput. Being without the CCR for hours or even days is simply unacceptable in an SDBR environment. For example, in one implementation which I led, the CCR was a laser cutting machine. The laser should have been in a temperature controlled environment, but had been situated in a shed that got extremely hot and humid during the summer months. Unsurprisingly, its reliability was extremely poor. As with other steps I've outlined to exploit the scarce capacity at the CCR, focus is essential. The CCR should be set up properly and regularly maintained. It is literally now your most precious resource. For instance, cheap tooling that breaks frequently and needs replacing is literally robbing you of many, many times more than you ever saved in lost throughput. Conduct an assessment and see how your machine compares to the original equipment manufacturer's standard and recommended operating procedure. Address the issues you find immediately. Even fixing problems that require what seems like a considerable amount of money typically recruit the investment in a very short period of time as throughput goes up dramatically. Ensure your maintenance team understands how important the CCR is. When the CCR breaks down, Everything else takes second place to getting the CCR up and running again. Maintenance should come running from whatever else they've been doing. This is real subordination. How much time do you and your people spend each day sorting out problems? Things that should have gone smoothly, but for whatever reason hit a glitch. Mostly minor, sometimes major, but nevertheless hit a problem that required intervention to sort out. How many work orders pass through your organisation without needing any intervention at all? The zero defects approach was introduced to me by a client here in Wales. It sets out to systematically address each of the major causes of failure in the organisation's processes and dramatically reduce failure demand. Failure demand is the demand placed on the organisation's capacity to rectify problems that should not have occurred. Failure demand consumes the time and attention of people in the business above and beyond what they should be doing to operate the business. 
A zero defect approach is straightforward to implement. Simply make a note of every work order that experiences a problem as it goes through the system and categorize the problem. For instance, a problem at assembly with missing parts or the wrong type of parts might be categorized as a bill of materials problem. As data is collected, it can be collated and organized as a Pareto chart. The category of problem occurring with the most citations on the Pareto becomes the focus of analysis and then improvement. The root cause of the problem is identified and action is taken to remove the cause, thereby preventing a whole host of future problems that themselves cause failure demand. The process is ongoing, and as the most frequently cited problem on the Pareto is addressed, the focus moves to the next most frequently cited problem, and so on. And the really nice thing about this approach is that it extends from the moment a customer gets in contact with the business to aftercare support. Nothing that can go wrong in the business is excluded, and this can release huge amounts of capacity to focus on the business's constraint and grow in the business. I'll talk more about this approach in part two, but suffice to say now, this is a powerful approach to releasing capacity on the CCR as it prevents delays before the CCR or defective orders crossing the CCR and consuming capacity that could or should have been used to generate more throughput and reduce the queue. Overtime on the CCR extends the period for which the CCR's capacity is available, enabling our plant to increase the amount of throughput generated at the CCR and reduce the queue and therefore the manufacturing lead time. Think of it this way, if the plant operates for one shift of eight hours, authorising an additional four hours of overtime on the CCR will increase output by up to 50%. There is a queue of work waiting for the CCR, so the time will certainly be used productively and the downstream work centres have more capacity than the CCR, so we'll be able to cope with the extra output from the CCR. Financially, the additional throughput from extending the CCR's operation will almost certainly dwarf the additional operating expense of the overtime. In throughput accounting terms, we express this equation as net profit is equal to throughput minus operating expense. In this case, it is the delta, or difference in net profit, throughput and operating expense. We are increasing both throughput and operating expense by authorising overtime, but throughput goes up at a much faster rate, thereby increasing net profit. I'll discuss this a lot more in the Throughput Academy videos on throughput accounting, but authorising the temporary or occasional use of overtime at the CCR is a highly cost-effective way of increasing throughput. Lastly, we get to step four of the five focusing steps, elevate the system's constraint, or the CCR in the case of our plant. And in all of the plants I've worked in, I've never gotten to the point where we need to buy a new machine yet. Sure enough, if sales continually grow, additional capacity will be needed at some point. But the actions taken to implement the first three steps of the five focusing steps are often so powerful that they release significant amounts of capacity, making investment unnecessary. And, as we are only dealing with a CCR, not the constraint, buying another machine is rarely necessary. Only the other day I had a meeting with a client and we discussed all the ways in which we could increase output of their CCR. At the end of the meeting, the client told me that in the meeting immediately prior to our meeting, they'd agreed to invest money in another machine and that wasn't now necessary. So I saved them a lot of money. Remember, the market is the constraint in an SDBR implementation. The CCR is just a resource that struggles to keep up with the other resources in the plant, and all we're trying to do is eliminate the queue in front of it. Taking a number of the actions I've listed above is almost always sufficient to increase capacity such that we are able to eliminate or significantly reduce the queue. But, having said all that, at some point, if sales increase, investment in another machine will eventually become necessary. In throughput accounting terms, we can examine this decision using the following formula. Return on investment equals the additional throughput generated by the increase in capacity of the new machine divided by the required investment to acquire the machine. I'll discuss this in more detail in a video on throughput accounting, but an investment on the constraint almost always pays for itself very, very quickly. And we've reached step five. Go back to step one. This is a process of ongoing improvement and there is no finishing line. As this is the subject of the next video, we'll explore it in more detail there.
I'm sure having covered those 12 tactics to increase throughput at the CCR, you're able to predict the effect of those actions on the queue in front of the CCR. If capacity is increased at the CCR, throughput goes up. If throughput goes up and no new work orders are joining the queue, or they are joining the queue at a rate less than the CCR's capacity to process them, the inevitable effect is that the queue must be reducing, sometimes rapidly reducing. Throughput for the plant as a whole goes up as work orders trapped behind the CCR flow more quickly to downstream work centres, who, having more capacity than the CCR, flush those work orders out more quickly than the previous rate of throughput. How long the queue takes to really clear depends on the increase in capacity and the size of the queue to start with. How long the queue takes to clear depends on the increase in capacity and the size of the queue to begin with. But remember, inventory equals lead time, and as throughput of the CCR goes up, inventory is being flushed out of the plant and our manufacturing lead time is decreasing. When lead time decreases and the production lead time stays the same, our due date performance must improve. So, this is how we complete the third step in the implementation of SDBR.